Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Identity theft is one of the fastest growing crimes in the U.S. One lawmaker has a proposal to help Minnesota victims, plus a discussion about health insurers transferring profits out of state and ways to prevent welfare fraud. All of this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The headline on a recent CNN tech article read, if you live in the U.S. and breathe oxygen, there's a good chance you may be impacted by the latest security breach. News about breaches at Equifax, Yahoo, and Target have frustrated consumers, and identity theft is one of the fastest growing crimes in the country. Senator David Senjum has authored a bill that would create a pathway for victims of identity theft to begin to reclaim their status, and he now joins me in the studio. Welcome. It's good to be here. Where did the idea of an identity theft passport originate? Well, I'll be honest with you. It, it actually originated with Representative Quam. He's, uh, he's my House member in the Rochester area. He, uh, he came up with the idea, brought it to me, and wanted me to be uh, chief Senate author, author, if you will. And so I, I consented. And, uh, and so that, that's basically where it started. But you know, as, as you just pointed out in your intro, uh, identity theft is, is, is fairly prevalent across the United States. So. We know it's here. Uh, we hope it's not going to get any worse, but maybe it will. And uh, so let's at least try to do what we can to prepare people, at least from the standpoint of what state government can do uh, to help. I understand that, that part of the plan is to make it easier for people to rebuild their lives after they've experienced identity theft. So there's the financial part. I wanted to ask about the medical part, because in Forbes 2014, in an article, they, they profiled a woman who not only had her financial information stolen, but this person also took her her medical. They 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 racked up medical bills and and they also put their medical information on hers. And she had a horrible time sorting that out, as well. Would this passport help at all with any kind of medical fraud, or is it strictly financial? It's strictly financial, uh, and with with law enforcement, it's it's not uh, directly. I don't think going to affect the uh, you know that kind of a situation. I do know I passed employee of Mayo Clinic. I know, I know how hard we work on setting up those firewalls and, and triple firewalls and things like that. But it, it, this, this particular legislation wouldn't, uh, wouldn't help there that I can think of. Uh, we just have to rely on good safeguards within each medical institution to protect those records. So walk us through what it would do. Let's say your identity has been stolen. There's a whole bunch of bills. Sure. Um, perhaps even criminal criminal charges against you for something sure. that you didn't yeah. do. How does this work? Well, this isn't probably all the same. It's, 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 it's a tool, if you will. Uh, so it's, it's, not, uh, it's not everything. But uh, for instance, if your identi you know, identity was, uh, was uh, robbed, if you will, uh, taken and, and used inappropriately, you would uh, confront, uh, or at least uh, go to the police department, uh, register your situation and uh, with law enforcement uh, they would uh, ascertain whether or not it was uh, legitimate or not and uh, should it be legitimate deemed to be legitimate you would have an opportunity to through the state government uh, apply for and receive what we call an identity theft passport that passport is simply a card or would be a card and uh, it could be used with creditors or it could be used in law enforcement if you were to be approached for not paying bills or something like that. Uh, so it's, it's just, again, a, a, a small tool that, that might help you through some of the hardship that goes along with this happening to an individual. What is the responsibility of businesses to ensure that the credit that they're granting or the business that they're doing with an individual, that that person is who they say they are? Does business have any responsibility in the increase in identity theft? Well, you'd think so, but I'm not sure. You know, we all get credit card applications every day in the mail. Uh, I, I, I don't I don't know. I, I, I would like to think they had more responsibility. But we, do we show passports? Do we even show any level of ID when, we, uh, when someone applies to a, a credit card company? Uh, they, I think the answer is no. And so I think that's a wide open opportunity. Uh, uh, my wife always uh, you know, tear, tears up those yeah. envelopes and Th things well, like that. Well, they say that you should always be shredding right. the, that yeah, information. Exactly. Uh, and I think you just have to, there's, there's a lot of safeguards that People have to, I think, just apply to themselves and their lives to protect them. But as far as business is concerned, I, I, 
I, I know they don't want it to happen, but can it happen? Do they set the stage? I think they do. Do you think then that they bear any responsibility? Uh, they probably they they probably do. I I I don't know how you'd make a claim against a, a business like that. If you know they they may in, in a moral sense, yes, maybe have some responsibility, but. I don't know how you'd get recourse on, on something like that. At a news conference last month, you and yeah. Representative Quam, the House author, talked of building on the work that has been done with Real ID in terms of the how these passports would be sure. worked out. Real ID has been quite a battle. Do you expect there to be further battles with the kinds of information that might be included in these Real ID cards? No, I think the Real ID simply gives us an opportunity to. Uh, of course, as we go forward, real ID will will basically will be identifying people and and their citizenship and things like that. Uh, so we will have an official card on virtually everyone in Minnesota that certainly uh, chooses to to get real ID. And there will be a lot of people, uh, and I think more and more real ID will be an expectation of mm -hmm. a lot of people in a lot of situations. Uh, show me your ID and so on and so forth. Uh, but with respect to it, how, how the, that interfaces with this, I think it just, it's a good tool for, a, for this program to build on. Uh, in, in terms of concerns, we just finished a Minlar's hearing. Uh, we can only hope Real ID rolls out a lot better than Minsure did and Minlar's uh, did. Uh, and uh, that, would, that would be my, my principal concern right now, the rollout of that program. And uh, if it rolls out successfully, I see this program rolling out with it successfully. One last question. States like Iowa, Maryland, Arkansas actually have identity theft passport programs um, in their, in their, on their books, and their programs are managed by the Attorney General. Uh, as, as I read the bill, it says that Minnesota's program would be managed by the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Commerce. Why go this route in Minnesota versus the Attorney General? Uh, I guess simply because we chose, we don't often in Minnesota ask the Attorney General to run programs. Uh, they are they are there to do the work of the attorney general, and and that is you know to to look at the law and to and to be be the lawyer, if you will, for the state of Minnesota. Uh, whereas agencies uh, are are more functional in nature within our state government, and, and we normally expect agencies to do this as opposed to a constitutional officer. All right. Well, Senator Sengem, I look forward to more hearings on this, and thank you so much for coming today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. In the last legislative session, lawmakers passed a bill that opens up Minnesota's health care system to for-profit HMOs for the first time in 40 years. The law change also makes it easier for companies to transfer reserve funds. In October, Medica Health Plans transferred $120 million from its Minnesota nonprofit HMO to its for-profit Wisconsin insurance business, prompting bipartisan criticism of the move. Senator John Marty now joins me in the studio. Welcome. Pleasure to be with you. State regulators did approve this transfer, but a recent Human Services Committee hearing, uh, there was some very lively debate near the end about what constitutes substantial. Does this need to be clarified in the law? It, it should be, but I don't think the health department had to do what it did. They said it was not in the public interest, but they said their hands were tied because the law says they, can't, they can only intervene if they're transferring all or a substantial portion of their assets and they're transferring $90 million. I'd argue that's substantial. It's 11% of their total reserves. That's a substantial portion of it. And there are plenty of dictionary and other definitions that suggest that 11% and $90 million is substantial. So I don't think the regulatory agency, I don't think the Department of Health had to make that decision. And I'd like them to rethink it. But if they don't rethink it, we ought to change the law and make this stricter. But we should not be allowing them to transfer any money from the for-profit, from the non-profit, money that came from taxpayers. Most of that money came from taxpayers. And to be able to just turn that over because, well, you know, it's good for our for-profit side. Um, that's, that's stealing public money in my mind. I think it's outrageous. The move has been criticized by the governor, by the attorney general, and then lawmakers on both sides. 
If we transfer these, the, the, what these reserves are, and we're talking about a substantial portion, is that a substantial portion in Minnesota, or if now that there's interstate commerce, is it substantial for you know these companies now that are have their fingers in all these states? You know, where where right. is the cap? Well, first of all, I don't think you should be allowing any. I think zero should be the cap. I think the entire law that caused this to happen, that passed in 2017, was a huge mistake. Some of the proponents of the law were saying, you know. 49 other states allow for-profit insurance companies. Minnesotans the only one that doesn't. So we got to get on the bandwagon with everyone else. Those other 49 states, if they've been doing good with their health care, they're worse off than we are. Somehow, and I'm not quite sure how allowing for-profit insurance in health care is going to make things better. It doesn't bring down costs in order for them to succeed for their shareholders. They have to either deny more claims, which is not good for the public, or they have to charge more, which is the thing we're fighting against. So why we think it's a good idea to bring in for-profit ones in the first place. Well, Republicans are going to argue that that's going to allow for more competition, right. therefore driving down the cost. And those other 49 states already have that, and then it's driven down the cost so much that the costs keep going like this. We're spending twice what anybody in the world spends on health care. And we keep thinking somehow we're going to outcompete ourselves on this. I, to me, I think we ought to look at not whether we're competing for selling insurance, but whether we're providing health care to people. And if we were to fund schools the way we fund health care, hospitals, it would be bizarre. You'd have school plans, and you'd have parents going out and shopping around for the best school insurance plan, and employers have to cover their subsidized thing. Huge rigmarole, huge cost to the system. Doesn't improve education, it just adds costs. And that's what we're doing with health care, and saying somehow we're going to get more competition and you're going to have more competition of plans people can't afford that don't cover the things they need covered. In terms of the, legis the next legislative session, do you think it's possible that uh, what is earned in Minnesota or what is from Minnesota, what happens in Minnesota should stay in Minnesota? Yes. Is there a way to maybe clarify well, we that? We could simply say you're not allowed to take your nonprofit assets and convert them for any purpose. You cannot convert them to for-profit. You can't shift them out of state. Those reserves were required by state law for the public programs they were running. These are private businesses running state public programs. And so we said you have to have some reserves in case things go really bad. So we allowed them to build up billion dollar reserves, billion dollars out of public money, largely public money. And saying, we see you they need that for this stability here. And they're saying, well, we don't need that stability here. We got more there. We'll back out of this market. So we're going to take that money we got from the taxpayers for, for providing health care to low-income people. We're going to shift it to our for-profit things. I hate to think of the payouts those board members and so on are going to get for that. We're going to shift it to Wisconsin. Why? I mean, I want to be fair to Wisconsin, but why do we want to give them all our money? This year, Medica pulled out of the Minnesota Medicaid market due to large losses. In July, a company press release announced expansion of plans in Wisconsin. Do you think those two things are possibly related? Well, yes. I mean, they're saying we, we can make more money there, and we can be a for-profit, and we can do this. So to me, I'm not, what they're doing makes perfect sense to their shareholders in their for-profit branch. We're just giving them money that's a great deal for them. I understand why they want to do it. I don't understand why Minnesota legislature and Minnesota regulators think that's a good idea. I cannot see any arguments, zero arguments, on why that's in the public interest why it's in the taxpayers' interest, why it's in the interest of people who need health care. Do you think this problem could have been foreseen? And to your knowledge, are any other companies doing this? I think other companies will likely do this if Medica gets away with it. First of all, this was what they're saying is a not substantial portion, only $90 million. So they do another $90 million well, next year. if they have billions of dollars, yeah. then perhaps and it's not And they'll keep doing $90 million a year. Well, they're a competitor, so they're going to say, hey, they're going to say, hey, you know, we got some for-profit branches. We'll just convert the money to there. It's good for us. So I foresee it happening with more companies. And again, there were efforts. Some of, uh, some of us were trying to put in place a ban on this so they could not convert the money. And I, I think it's urgent that we do so. But I still want us to go back and get this money back that's being converted now. Do you think it's possible that there can be interstate competition while ensuring Minnesota taxpayer investments and incentives remain here? Can, can those two things be validated, I well, guess? Well, I, I guess the whole question is why do we want this interstate competition for selling health insurance? 
again, I don't want to have school insurance where parents have to do that. It doesn't make any sense. What we want to do, what makes sense for Minnesota, is to cover people, to make sure people have health care coverage. How any of this money getting transferred to some for-profit company for any purpose, for how this money getting transferred to Wisconsin for any purpose is in the public interest, it's not. It's just clearly not near the interest. So we've got to stop it. That's the first thing we do is we stop that. But then recognize our goal is not to have competition in purchasing insurance. The whole insurance market on health care is going crazy at the federal level, too. What we should be doing is figure out how we get health care for people. And the state is putting billions of dollars into it. We ought to get what we're putting into it and get a good system out of it. Senator Marty, thank you for your time today. My pleasure. Over the past several years, state lawmakers have taken measures to end what is commonly referred to as welfare fraud. State officials have added proper identification to cards providing users access to public programs, and agencies are making efforts to cross-check identities against felony and drug conviction databases, ensuring that public support is properly directed to the needy families that these programs are designed to help remains a priority at the Minnesota Legislature. Senator Rich Dreheim is one lawmaker who is working to end welfare fraud, and he now joins me in the studio. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Over one million people in Minnesota receive some form of public assistance, whether it's food stamps, Medicaid, child care, cash assistance. How widespread, in your estimation, is the problem of fraud? You know, I, I, we've been told different numbers, but it basically comes down we don't know. And we, to me, the first step when examining entitlements would be to try to identify who's on the programs and then go a little deeper into why they're on the programs and do they qualify for those programs. We hear stories of people uh, being from uh, outside Minnesota, other states coming in and applying for aid and then also trying to apply for aid in other states. And there are some um, network of software that are supposed to catch those people. Um, there's software out there that you can use a third-party vendor to kind of um, examine the data. So if they have a credit card or a uh, phone bill, let's say in Illinois or whatever state, pick your state, um, you know, then we can maybe examine those people, put them on a list and, and look at them a little more. So I, I'm in favor of um, using an outside third-party software company to help us police those lists a little bit. So you're, and, you're in favor of the legislature contracting with, with an outside party to just double check, verify exactly. that the people that are receiving assistance are des deservedly receiving that assistance. Exactly. As our, our um, demographics of our state change and, and our population's aging and we're going to have less people working, so right now we have a shortage of finding workers but we'll have a statistical deficit of workers in the coming five to ten years. Yeah, the, that's been widely publicized, yes. Exactly. So when, when they're not working, we're not collecting income tax. They tend to spend less. We have less sales tax. Property taxes will probably contract a little bit because there won't be the growth, which we live on. Um, so resources will be more important and, and tighter. So to make sure we have the resources to help the people that really need the help, we have to do a better job of policing who's on the entitlements. A couple examples, there have been, there's been some success with, with tracking these. In March, a Fridley woman was charged for illegally tapping three programs. She received 118000 in public assistance illegally. Two Mankato residents also were charged with attempting to receive over $75,000 illegally in public funding. So we have tough laws. In addition to maybe contracting and verifying, what more needs to be done? You know, I think there's some simple things we can do, you know, baby steps. There's no magic wand we can wave to, to solve a problem. There's always people going to be trying to beat the system. Um, but I think some of it's self-reporting. So on, on some of the applications from that, I've, I've talked to three different uh, groups of people from different counties, and they've all indicated the same thing. There's some self-reporting that goes on. Um, you that, mean that people are, are, that, that are, are saying that they're... they're correct. There's some okay. acid verification okay. and other, other things. Oh, that, I see what you're saying. Just double-checking. Correct. Okay. So um, 
you know, some of it is probably honest mistakes, and you know, obviously they should be forgiven for that, but sometimes they're not so honest mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's some simple things with sitting down with the people that work it on the county level every day, and, and we can be uh, um, a little more transparent to help the people that need to be helped, and yet please the people that are just trying to beat the system. One article I read mentioned the difficulty in discovering, as you've, you've talked about, welfare fraud, and it requested help from the public when suspicion arises. What can members of the public do if, if they think, you know, I'm not sure if that person should be receiving assistance? You know, they can call, um, there's a 800 number, they can call a tip line, uh, you can contact the local uh, jurisdiction, so if it's a county, call the county. Um, there's, uh, I, think, I think there's a lot more fraud than we really realize. Um, I, I, I hear probably every week someone tells me a story about someone that they feel are, are on programs that shouldn't be on programs. And of course, there's always two sides of the story, but it should be investigated, it should be looked at. In a Star Tribune article from March, the state's Deputy Inspector of General Fraud Investigations explained that counties handle investigations into fraud differently. But the state has a measure to help gauge their effectiveness. From your perspective, can the state do more to help local officials in their investigations? Yeah, I think I'm sure there's things we can do. I, I know there's been a little bit of a shift from having um, non-law enforcement investigators to the shift to someone that has um, a law maybe enforcement a, background or employed with the sheriff's okay. department. Okay. So they kind of share that person or. Um, there are a licensed law officer that works for the sheriff's office um, that does the investigation. So they're kind of like contracted out. Mm -hmm. So by being a, a, a member of the sheriff's office, they would have resources to some other databases that someone that doesn't have that law enforcement background. So in a sense, we're, we're pooling resources um, to help mm -hmm. further some of these yeah. investigations. Yeah, and, and, and with if they're a detective with the sheriff's office, they probably have a little different training, um, little different instincts um, with their past experience. And, and I think that's the route I think you'll see more and more counties going towards. So we need to hear from those county employees on, you know, talk to your legislators, you know, come and, and visit us, come and visit me. Um, you know, we, we need to hear from people with ideas. We need solutions. You know, it doesn't do any good to point fingers or complain about somebody. We need solutions and we need to take those baby steps to make it better. So. You have authored various bills to assist people with local programs. For example, you sponsor a bill seeking grants to help hard to, hard to train individuals. You authored a bill establishing a farm to food shelf program. Does the state need to seek more creative ways to help families in need? Definitely. We need, you know, to me, we leverage our state assets with a nonprofit assets. I think that's the best way. Um, you know, and I encourage everybody to give back, find something that you are very passionate about and volunteer your time and or money. Um, the, the programs I really get drawn to are the ones where, um, you know, they're helping people that no one else wants to help, like convicts. Mm -hmm. um, and they are paid back from the state or given a grant or money after they perform. So instead of just throwing a bunch of money and hope they do something, here there's some accountability. They work with people that just got out of prison. They um, kind of give them a rah-rah, um, you know, self-worth mm -hmm. type evaluation. Help them establish a new way of living, they, get it back on their feet. Correct, you know, family values, um, you know, self-worth, um, and then get them on a career path job. Not just a job, but a career path job and help them train to that. And then once they get employed, then the state pays that agency that did all that work. That's a win-win for everybody. And you'd like to see more of that. Correct, yeah. So pay for performance. Senator Draham, it's such a pleasure to have you on Thank the you. program. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Symmetry, functionality, and beauty were essential components of architect Cass Gilbert's aesthetic. Brian Pease of the Minnesota Historical Society explains how these concepts come together in the grand second floor of the Capitol. The second floor of the state Capitol is really the focal point of all of the activity that happens here. 
What was Cass Gilbert's idea behind this particular design? The uh, second floor is really called the grand floor of the Capitol because it's where everyone can come up here, get access to the chambers, the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. And it's a place where all that activity is taking place each day of session. So you have people lobbying for interest groups here. You have the public that are here to talk to their legislators and so forth or go to the Supreme Court for their hearings. So really the, the envision that Cass Gilbert had for this uh, space in the second floor was to be a grand space where you really get a sense of the, the architecture, these beautiful colonnades of Italian marble column and Minnesota stone. And you also get a place where people feel friendly or welcoming into those spaces as at the same time they're visiting or coming here for business. In the other capitals I've visited, I've noticed that the House chamber is often across from the Senate chamber, but not here in our capital. What is the reason for that? Well, I think what Cass Gilbert was looking at doing is creating a, a symmetrical building. And so we have, in 1905, there were 63 senators, not the 67 we have today, but we had 119 House members. So that's almost twice the size. So I think for him, how you construct a building with one end of the building with a smaller chamber and the other opposite end with a huge chamber just doesn't fit architecturally. So he put the Senate chamber on the west side of the building, the Supreme Court, a smaller chamber of course, on the opposite end and then the house because of its size fit perfectly in the north corridor or the north side of the buildings. It may just be a matter of folklore but I've read that the placement of the house chamber looking at the city of St. Paul is important in terms of representing the people, that the speaker is looking at the people. Is that true? Yeah, and that, that's a lot of people look at the, the way the uh, spaces have been designed or laid out, uh, that Gilbert was looking at the house being kind of the approachable. It's more of the people's house. The members serve a two-year term, so there's more rotation or more changeover as uh, members leave or get uh, re-elected or not re-elected. And there are more of them. And there's more of them as well. And so the idea is it kind of symbolically it faces the public, faces downtown St. Paul. In 1905 when the Capitol opened, the cons all of the state's constitutional offices were housed in this building and that's not true today. Can you talk more about that? Sure. The uh, whole idea of the building here was this is the seat of state government. So you have your executive branch officers, you have the governor, lieutenant governor, the state treasurer, the state auditor, the uh, secretary of state, uh, the Attorney General all housed within this one building in 1905. And that gives you a sense of how this building has changed over its 112 year history because you have uh, a lot of those constitutional officers moving out to different chambers. They're going into uh, the state office building back in the 60s and the 70s. You had the administration building where the treasurer moved into. Now the treasurer, we as a constitutional amendment, abolished the treasurer's office so there no longer is a treasurer. And that also fits in with the, the history of the Supreme Court too. They uh, were, until the 1990s, uh, everything they had here, the offices, the law library, the chamber was their headquarters, kind of their center gathering place for all the work and all the business they do. And then when the uh, Judicial Center was open, they moved there. And so they have new uh, Supreme Court and appellate court offices and also uh, chambers there. But they still use this space in the state capitol as an important part of their connection to this building. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.